Right, okay, so we have, back by popular demand, the Petri Culture Sessions, and I'd like to start by introducing Jim from the University of Kent, and his Petri Culture is entitled, Times They Are A-Changing. Hi, we've had an inform, informal change management system at Kent for a very, very long time, requiring staff to mail a mailing list called System Bookings at least a couple of days in advance of planned system interruptions. It gave us a chance to warn our users, and it was simple and surprisingly effective. And this meant it got used generally. Very important. You probably know the principles of change management. Managing changes can reduce the number of issues needing firefighting, reduce the time to fix when fires do break out. If a change causes an issue for a service, the quicker the cause is identified, then the quicker the service can be fixed. If enough thought is put into planning a change, then user impact is minimised. Perception of ITIL is that it's an awful lot of paperwork, it's all admin, it's boring, it stops you doing real work. Nobody likes doing this. It does take a little bit of paperwork, it does take a little bit of effort, but if you do the right changes in the right way, it helps real work happen properly. Our ITSM tool, BMC Footprints, was agreed by our ITIL steering group as a recording platform, and I was tasked to develop a change management process to include recording, notification, and approval systems. Lightweight email consultation for changes was agreed, and the change advisory board was minimal. Key managers were shown our, our draft thoughts, and then all developers and operations staff were invited to a big presentation. I gritted my teeth and prepared for a barrage of abuse. Although there was a lot of input and clearly strong feelings, the overall message was actually people were starting to appreciate the idea. Introducing big changes takes time for people to get used to and shouldn't be rushed. My next step was to speak individually to each line manager to explain where necessary what the, my expectations were, find out what the problems and obstacles in their individual teams might be. It was slow and painstaking. We had to go through the change curve, of course. I'm sure you've all seen this before. If you haven't, look it up. Allowing time for people to follow the familiar change curve is absolutely essential. The danger is that if staff don't buy in, they'll simply sneak in changes without recording them. Yes, I went through a bit of depression, a bad time. Some of the senior managers were very supportive. They offered size nine boots to kick people up the arse. Um, I said, no, sorry, if I haven't got a good argument to convince everybody that this is what we should be doing, then maybe we shouldn't be doing it. Keep your size nines. It was slow. We needed lots of time. You can't rush this sort of thing. Change always takes time. I wasn't under too much pressure. I took probably far too much time. Uh, we went through a number of processes. Final one was a search tool, which helped with usability and helped with buy-in. A back-out plan, of course, essential. If you've got to change, if things go pear shaped you've got to be able to undo it. You can see my words are going all over the place now. <laughs> risk assessment. Assessing risk is not easy, and staff needed help to support with. Uh, impact and probability, you can do the matrix, it helps a little bit. We provide a little bit of guidance. Um, the CAB assesses whether anybody's cheating, and if they need a bit of help, they know where to come, they can ask, you know, how do I do the risk assessment? So we talk to them. Our original change management system just recorded changes which interrupted our services. We wanted to record even things which are simply at risk, and we have a huge number of at-risk changes now. Defining what changes you record, that's the difficult bit. I cheated. I delegated that to the managers in charge of each of the development teams. It's a big culture change. Um, not just about ticking boxes, it's about getting staff to really appreciate why they're doing change management. The benefit of planning, risk assessment, involving others, recording stuff, letting users know. Some of the questions I get asked now tells me it's sort of working. Part of the process 
we are staff to discuss the changes with colleagues and, if possible, gain approval from an appropriate manager, not necessarily the CAB. They record the names of peers and other stuff, but we trust them to have gone through this process. No, that's actually our Vice Chancellor, I think, at the back there. It's not the CAB. We don't have big formal meetings like that. We only actually meet quarterly, and not to actually approve or, or otherwise, and simply to assess the process and see how things are going. We try to be people's friends, not the enemy. The core part of the process is the majority of changes, if they have a low risk and have a backup plan, are automatically approved. And the staff know that. So if they follow the rules, there's no risk to them that their change won't be approved. And that, again, builds trust. If it does need approval by the CAB, which is quite rare, then, again, they trust us, they know that we're not going to say, you're not doing that. We're going to come talk to them, we're going to discuss what changes we can make, make it happen, what the risks are. We're going to help them through the process. A key piece of feedback from the teams, they wanted a, a single search tool to be able to get value out of the system to show when changes were made. Um, so you have a problem, you want to see at a particular time what changes were made to the system. And the single search tool allows you to do that. The other lesson was make sure that all of the people understand that this is not a process, not a system that's set in stone. They can feed in at any time and suggest changes to it. So the change management can be, the process can be changed itself. And there's whole things about change. There's three levels of change here going on. Finally, embed. You need a lot of empathy. You need to deal with a lot of flack. You need to deal with the culture change. I think it's worked for us. And I think that our services genuinely are less likely to be interrupted due to hasty changes. It still happens occasionally, but less so now. So bring on the auditors. Thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is Martin Putwain. I started working at MMU in to, uh, 2012. Um, before that, I worked at a service desk in the corporate world. And built into the service management software that we used was um, all sorts of processes, incident management, uh, major incident process, um, change management. And then I came to a service desk which used a small part of a quite old piece of software. Um, it didn't have most of the processes I was used to. And the two that it did have were kind of lumped together, and that was incident uh, and request fulfillment. The organization said they had change management, um, but they didn't really. It was um, more of a spreadsheet. I, I tried to develop the organization's needs for reporting, um, but the actual tool was badly configured. The service desk only used predefined um, calls. And so in the first week of term, we logged 1,600 uh, general inquiries about general inquiries. I tried to log a job um, on AV and there was three different ways to do it, one of which had never been used. So after completely reconfiguring the tool, we began to get some data. And after a few full starts with commercial dashboards, we created a thing of beauty on an Excel spreadsheet. Though it looked nice, to produce ad hoc reports was almost impossible unless you had a black belt in IT, in Excel. Um, we looked at some of your websites and we were a little bit jealous. Um, you had self-service and I dreamed of an end to that constant stream of email with no information which would possibly help us fix the problem. Uh, I dreamed of a web form where you'd have to put in some relevant details. So, there's only one thing for it. We needed to go out and buy a new piece of software because that's the panacea. Um, it would solve our problems and it was time to meet the salesman. After all, we kind of knew um, what we wanted. Buying service management software isn't like buying bagels or something like that. Um, it's more complicated than if you want to buy your wife a really amazing birthday present. And once you said what you're going to do, you'll get more people calling you up for help than if you went popped into every estate agent in town and told them you're about to sell your house. 
Thankfully, there are organisations like the Service Desk Institute who are a little more impartial and who will put on events to help you select a supplier. Now, I was told not to tick all the ITIL processes on the expression of interest form, but to go away and think about it. I still had the bastard incident and fulfilment process and the dreaded spreadsheet of change. I could do this. I'd done ITIL before, and I got it. And that's when I started hearing stories from James about when he first started at MMU, and the people that came up to him and said, you're here to introduce that newfangled ITIL. We don't think that thing's going to work around here. We just don't want it in our organisation. In 2013, I almost employed an entirely new team, including an incident and problem coordinator, which gave us the opportunity and stability we required to start working on processes. Obviously, with a job title like that, change management would be the first thing we're going to tackle. So, we started to build our first process. Change with a cab. Uh, the requirements to speak to stakeholders, communications and everything. Uh, we built it into SharePoint, tested it, tweaked it, removed some of the ill-conceived tweaks like trivial changes which our infrastructure team put in to um, explain those changes which they make all the time. Um, if I have to say it myself, we were pretty successful. We'd involved everyone who regularly makes changes, made them part of the process. It was so successful that people from outside of IT services who also deliver IT services, came and took part in the cab. It wasn't how I expected it to be. So, that's one in the bag. What will we tackle next? Martina wanted problem management. After all, it's in her job title. So she created a presentation for the managers. Everyone thought it was a good idea. We held a workshop. When somebody at the workshop said that all calls are problems to somebody, we realised that we might not be on the same page. But we persevered. And using some of the methods we'd used before uh, and some ideas we had about prioritising problems, we got a process together. Some people got hung up on the accuracy of prioritising, but they missed the, current, the point that we currently fix problems based on a whim, so anything's an improvement. Now it was time to deal with incident fulfilment. There are some very different requirements for incident management where customers want it fixed yesterday and request fulfilment when they need it when it's needed. Unless, of course, you've arranged a conference for 100 people who all need Wi-Fi access, but you forgot to email the helpline until the first delegate arrives. So, it was time to arrange another workshop. Um, we work, arranged it with the people that work day in, day out with managing the flow of incidents so they could tell us what worked for them in their teams. We knew we couldn't throw service operation version 3 at them, and we were a little worried that if they, we did, they'd throw it back, and it's not a small book. We went to see some of our colleagues at other universities and we spoke about processes, cost, web portals, time and effort, reports, what people didn't like, what people did, their frustrations, their moments of joy, and what we found was interesting, though not entirely surprising. Not everyone is entirely happy with their service management software, even after changing it. Some people have problems when it comes to logging jobs or reporting, most organisations don't net use anywhere near the full functionality of their software and most organisations don't keep it up to date so the functionality they want isn't always available to them. So now I know what you're thinking. Here we all are at slide number 19 and I've mentioned salesmen but I haven't talked about evaluation process, tendering or anything around buying software. I don't think that stuff matters too much for this presentation. Um, I'm sure whomever deals with procurement in your institution will ha gladly help you make the right decision. But the big mistake that which our university made in the past was not to engage effectively with the people who would be using the software and allow them to help define the processes. The system is only a tool, and the people who use the tool and use the processes within it are going to determine how successful it is for you. Thank you very much. Under, and I work for the University of Cambridge. I agreed to do this Petra Cut show before I found I couldn't actually come to the conference this year, so I'm recording it ahead of time and trusting someone else to play it. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? If you're in a traditional monolithic structured university, 
You're probably wondering where the problem is in upskilling your IT staff. You just decide what the skills are at the top, and you push them down the pyramid. And if you are a single structure, then that works remarkably well. This works less well, however, when each of your departments, each of your colleges, each of your schools is an independent department. This gives you a whole myriad of tiny IT departments where you have one or two people who pretty well do everything. And not only do you get that, but you get this whole fragmentation of having hundreds and thousands, you see what I did there, of various different IT departments all pulling in different ways, all trying to do their own thing with no unanimity to their effort at all. An additional problem is that they're generally overlooked not by IT professionals, but by the department administrators, or in some cases, uh, IT committees of academics, both of whom have trouble actually distinguishing what the IT terminology is and separating it from the technical speak that they might hear on Doctor Who or Star Trek. Of course, it also doesn't help that if you're a small IT department, you end up very task-oriented and very reactive to the things that are coming in. You find it very difficult to communicate with peers. And because of the reactive nature of most of the work that's arriving on your doorstep, you find it very difficult to think ahead. All your work is reactive, and when it comes to actually planning strategies or planning your own development and looking what skills you may need for the next three to five years, you're stuck very much in the present. So how can those of us at the centre encourage people to either take control of their own development or help administrators know how better to develop their IT staff? Fortunately, we have a mantra that we can use in these circumstances, a piece of advice that helps you know how to negotiate this morass of different tangled departments, how to get what you want out of other people elsewhere in the organisation, and it's not that. It's that they do not know. Most of the administrators don't know how to develop their IT staff because they have no idea what their IT staff need. Most of the IT staff don't know that it should be their responsibility to take these things on. So maybe, in fact, it's not their problem at all, but ours. We need to be communicating better with departments as to how they develop their IT staff. After all, the administrator isn't out to impede things. They want the best for their department too, they just don't have the information. So how do we create these avenues, both to the managers of the IT staff and to the IT staff themselves? Well, at the moment we've got an opportunity of an ongoing IT review that we're implementing. And so it gives us a good in with people to say, we need to come to talk to you as part of implementing the review. And it opens more doors than, uh, than you might ordinarily expect. The other thing is that there is this old saying that if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And fortunately, we've had something of a hammer in a series of seminars that we've put on for IT staff over the years, both as a means of further training and as a means of communicating services that they can get at from the, uh, from the central computing service. And these have gone under the brand of TechLink. And they certainly provide a means by which we can pass on information about what we see as future trends. Though, of course, the individual IT practitioner doesn't need to come to them if they don't feel the subject particularly suits them. And so it sometimes may be difficult to give it the sell there. For the administrator, it's worth talking about financial issues. Cambridge had a bit of a charmed life on the financial front because of its stature, but increasingly now people are beginning to have to wonder whether they can pay for things where the projects can create efficiencies. And as part of that also, it's worth raising the, the subjects of litigation, liability and risk. Because again, they do not know. An administrator may not understand why so much has to be paid for information security and keeping things robust, resilient and up. So it's clearly up to us, the Central University Information Service, to provide a clear steer both to the managers of the IT departments and to the IT practitioners themselves as to how to develop. But the IT review also gives us more tools than just the hammer. Firstly, it raises the issues of secondment and shadowing 
And these can be quite tricky when you have single-handed IT departments. Who's going to cover the work while the main IT practitioner is away? But at least it means they will come back with new skills, new ideas, and new approaches to tackling problems. The other thing that the IT review has suggested is creating career pathways. Chart out what the differences are between the requirements for different grades of IT staff and give people an idea of what training they need to upskill themselves from their current grade to the next grade. Well, that's been a bit of a scattergun description, but there's a limit to what you can do in six minutes. I hope at least I've managed to persuade you that staff development is more of a challenge in a distributed environment like Cambridge than it is within a monolithic structure. And at least I hope I've managed to get something of your sympathy as well. But thank you for listening. If you've got any questions at all, I am on the other end of the line, so do feel free to either tweet me now. Um, if I've got reception, I shall be answering questions as we speak. Or do get in touch with me after the conference and you'll find my email address on the SSG Committee's webpage. Thank you. Well, hello again. Um, a bit like deja vu, I'm afraid. Um, but... Uh, Last year's conference had a discussion with a difference around central help desk working with local IT. It's something we've looked at in quite a bit of detail in our service desk consolidation project. And uh, I thought I'd share with you just uh, some of the ideas that have come out around that. So Oxford, uh, you just heard about Cambridge's devolved environment, we're rather like that. Um, the uh, Oxford, Oxford IT is scattered all over the centre of Oxford. There are uh, probably the same number of IT people as there are tourists sat around there, um, hundreds of us. Um, but we follow the principle of subsidiarity, which means the central IT is subsidiary to local IT. The power is out there, they know what's needed. Uh, this does lead to a question of diversity or duplication. Uh, it's a really good thing to have that split, but uh, it does mean we end up doing things twice sometimes. There's a lot of overlap. Uh, we can end up doing exactly the same things. Um, but, uh, but one of the key differences is around the management structure. Paul mentioned uh, uh, the fact that in local IT it kind of pops up all over the place, um, whereas in central IT you've got these lines of management going all the way up, in our case, to, uh, to the University Council. Um, you can see we've kind of got responsibilities around uh, some very similar things, networks, lots of desktop management and all that kind of stuff. But the key thing is we both offer a point of contact um, and, and support. The way we set it up, the way we describe our service level agreements and so on, uh, generally is that local IT out in the colleges and departments should be the first point of contact for our students. Uh, but they can't always solve all the issues, and so the students will come through to central IT quite a bit. Only our users get confused and they come to central IT first in just as many cases, so we really need to work together um, to deliver the, the overall user experience. It requires a lot of partnership, and it was something that was very much in our minds uh, when we went into our, our merger. So that was uh, a couple of years back now. Um, and it meant that we had to review the relationship in order to get this kind of um, sensible support function and deal with one of the drivers for it, which is about users being confused about where to contact. We really needed to understand how we were going to work uh, with local IT. So we set up the project I was talking about earlier. Uh, the idea was to consolidate our teams, to, to unify things, to make it much easier to access us. Uh, to be much more responsive. Um, but of course, an end user doesn't really see the difference between the work that we're doing in central IT and the relationship with that in the local IT. They just want us to get it all sorted. Um, and uh, so in our project, which is looking at uh, a number of ITIL processes um, uh, and bringing in a new tool set, these things are focused on sorting out central IT. They are not immediately uh, going to be shared with, uh, with our colleagues out in local IT, but we have had them involved. We have local IT from college and departments sitting on our board. They've been in the project team. They were involved in the, uh, the vendor selection and so forth. In our process designs, we looked through a good traditional ITIL style incident management process uh, and we raised the question, well, what happens if this starts out in one of the local units where they record things in their own tool set um, uh, and then pass it over into the central university? We haven't got the information that they recorded. Um, and uh, what happens if they start in the centre? We've done a whole lot of diagnosis, but then need to pass them out to the local units. And again, we can't share that information. We can't take ownership of the ticket. Uh, we can't make sure things are closed properly. We don't know about the linkages. And it could be a right old faff. 
Now, Tony, who heads up our ITS3 function, which um, provides a lot of support for those local ITSs, has been working uh, for many years diligently uh, on attempting to delegate powers, give local IT the ability to log into our central systems and resolve the calls by resetting passwords or um, allocating accounts out to people and so forth. And that means that when the user has gone to local IT, quite a lot of stuff can actually be sorted out there and then. Um, but it doesn't work for everything. Some of the face-to-face -face services, you've got to come on site to bring your laptop for fixing and so forth. So we had a look at uh, some operating models, how calls actually flow through um, in this mixed model of local IT and central IT trying to work together. And we spent about 30 minutes in this discussion and came up with five main models and uh, we sort of drew them out and had a look at them and reckon they pretty much cover all, the sort, all sorts of things that we do. So I picked three models to have a look at. Uh, model A, uh, a user wanders up to their local IT in their college and says, hi, I'm having problems logging into the VLE today. And uh, local IT say, that's great, but the web's up and everything, so um, I don't think that's really my problem. Um, and uh, so they uh, close the call with the user. That's the end of what local IT is going to do. And they send them off to central IT. So the user now goes off and has to make another phone call, walk up the road to us, uh, or, or send another email. No linkage between the, uh, the two functions here. Uh, so it's a redirect. And in this case, central IT get the ticket, uh, you know, do all the usual things to sort it out. Uh, and the, the user goes away happy. There are plenty of situations where that, that needs to happen. But in some situations, um, local IT don't want to expose the user to central IT. So in these, this might be a really busy head of department who's got a problem with their Microsoft Exchange calendar. Um, and uh, they see their local IT. Local IT know that central IT have got to be involved. But instead of passing the user off, local IT completely mask it. And that means they can use their local knowledge, their relationship with that individual to sort uh, the call out. Uh, so the last one uh, we're looking at now is uh, where a user comes into the central university initially. Uh, maybe they've got a problem with the wireless in their, their bedroom, which is provided by their, their college. Um, central IT will log some information, record that, pass all of that information through, usually by an email forwarding out the ticket to local IT. Um, and then with a bit of luck, the user is then able to pick the call up with local IT and, uh, and all the information's flowed through. So we've got a better linkage there. And by looking at those models, um, we were able to get a much better understanding about the various roles that we're playing in that incident management process. So we know who actually is raising the call. We know who actually um, is, is um, effectively playing the first line or the analyst um, and taking ownership for that, making sure it gets resolved, which is one of the key problems. Things get bounced from local IT to central IT or central IT to local IT, and people kind of forget who's making sure that this works out for the end user. Um, and it also then res um, resolves things around who, who's then working in the kind of second, third line or the resolver groups. Uh, and we could map that onto each of our models so people know much more clearly what they're doing. Um, having got that mapped out and understood, it means that we can communicate, the central IT and local IT can talk about what's actually going to happen, the ways that we'd like to work. We can share the information better. We can provide training for each other uh, uh, and have an overall shared understanding of that, going back to the beginning, how we actually work together um, to deliver that end-to-end -end experience for the user, despite the fact that it's all crossing organisational boundaries. So. Uh, I'm going to be around, hopefully for another couple of days. I don't have a train home until at least Friday. Um, uh, and some other contact details on that. Very happy to, do, uh, to talk further because I know several people here had an interest in it last year. But thank you very much for listening. Okay, um, I'm Tony Bryce, also from Oxford, John just mentioned me. Um, I'm Head of IT Support Staff Services. I'm part of the USIZER Support Services Group. This is going to be much more about soft skills, communication and assertiveness, and it should have been shorter. Um, we use too many words in universities. We're used to it. People tend to like to write posh because there's all these academics around. Don't do it. Say what you mean. Passive voice is great in a thesis. It's rubbish in a service announcement. We are doing this. Not it has been decided that we will do this. Recognise that at the bottom. Um, Dan Quayle, very bad. This one, you've just arrived in uh, an airport, maybe in London, you're getting a bus to Oxford. Uh, that's what they used to have on the seats. What's a load of rubbish? If English isn't your first language, you are never going to understand that. A picture in five words is much clearer. Think about it. Uh, punctuation, absolutely everything. I like cooking my family and my pets. Have you seen that one? A comma turns you into not a psycho. I'm not going to read the other one, but uh, I think you, uh, you get the idea. And hopefully... It will move on. Yes, reduce the rubbish. 
Say what you mean. Avoid jargon. Avoid acronyms. If you're in a meeting, someone uses jargon or acronyms, you don't understand, say so. Ask them. Almost certainly somebody else won't understand, and they will thank you for it. Likewise, the cliches, all this stuff that you put at the beginning of what you say, your emails, it adds nothing. It just bores people. It makes it longer. Um, prefaces, adverse prefaces. Maybe that's jargon itself, as John pointed out earlier. All this stuff at the beginning of your messages, if it's in an email, if it's written, it doesn't help. It just turns somebody off and think, oh no, something bad's coming. Uh, just say it and let them judge it for itself rather than thinking you're thinking it's going to be dodgy by adding one of those perhaps difficult phrases. Hostages to fortune. Who does service announcements in this place? Yeah, lots of us do, I'm sure. Wake up, wake up. Come on. Um, don't be specific unless you are sure about those specifics. You may not have chosen your product. Don't say that you have if you haven't. If you're not sure on the date, don't say the date. Just be a little bit vague about it. It's good to communicate. Proofread your own stuff. Watch how fast it's going to go by. You will miss mistakes for the same reason that you made them in the first place. Somebody else needs to do the proofreading for you. Can you see what's missing on the T-shirt? Miss is missing on the T-shirt. And does someone else understand? When you write something, run it past someone else, preferably not someone who's very close to what you're writing. See if they understand by what you wrote what you meant them to understand by it. If they didn't, try again. Uh, you need to get a match on people hearing what you think you have said in your writing or in your words. Don't skip this. It will make a mess. Listen. Don't just speak like I'm doing. You wouldn't use a phone without a speaker. Um, you need to show people that you understand what they're saying to you. Reflect back to them. Um, understand their body language. Understand yours. Think about how your body languages are interacting. Focus on who you're listening to. Don't say stuff like, oh yeah, that happened to me. I know what you're feeling. It doesn't work. Are you listening? Show you're listening. Do these things. Smile. Question. Clarify. Reflect. Talk about body language. Make eye contact. Lean into someone if you, if you want to show that you are interested in what they're saying breath. <laughs> <laughs> so, assertiveness. Um, assertiveness is about being positive and effective. It's a balance. Some people might sometimes be very passive and just let everybody do everything to them. Other people might be aggressive, push their way on everybody. You need to be in the middle. You need to balance your self-respect with showing respect for others. You need to balance your rights to be heard with their rights to be heard. Which one of these are you? We all have a mix of these types of people within us, the aggressive people who shout and tell you, you're going to do this now, don't argue with me, just do it. Um, the passive people say, well, I don't care, just do whatever you want to do. You know, none of these work. Think about how you respond in given situations and plan ahead. If you're facing a situation where you know you might not be what you want, think about it uh, and plan an alternative strategy. Here are the behaviours in a bit more. I won't say too much about them, but passive people, well, if you like, you know, aggressive people, you should do this. Indirect people, they might say one thing to one person, one thing to somebody else. They're manipulative. They set up relationships that don't work. Whereas assertive people will understand your rights and understand their own rights. They will gain respect. They will say, I think we should do this. They will be clear. They will include everybody. It's a win-win. Gotchas on emails. Remember, there's no body language. There's no tone in an email. A phone has tone. So if email is difficult, you can use a phone if you can't visit someone. Language is understood differently by everybody, so be careful about language. Your email can be forwarded to anybody. You shouldn't CC someone's email as part of a reply without permission. And if you're going to blind copy someone, ask why you're doing that. Are you trying to hide something? Is it something you perhaps shouldn't say in the first place? And if you are a blind copy recipient, don't reply at all, because you kind of out the person who uh, just blind copied you then. So uh, be careful. <laughs> Um, we had a slide earlier about dealing with tough email, but I think um, important points are to just read it several times. It's very easy to read a few sentences, oh, that's really annoying, I'm going to compose a really quick reply. Don't. Read it several times. It's the equivalent of listening properly to it. Draft, reply, sleep on it, check it with a colleague. Lots more advice there which you can see. Here's some stuff about assertive emails. They are well read because you've written them concisely. These are the things you need to have in them. You should understand what the situation is. You should show empathy. You should show what you think and feel and what you want to happen. And they should work towards a solution acceptable to all parties. They should be clear, specific, concise, and polite. We got the timing a bit wrong there, didn't we? 
But if it all goes wrong, and again we had a bit of this earlier, it's all right to say so. Accept some responsibility. Don't be passive and accept all of this unless it really is completely your fault. But you will gain respect by acknowledging responsibility for, for your part in a difficult situation. Saying sorry doesn't mean you're wrong or you're guilty. It might just mean you regret that you are in this situation. You might want to concede a minor point if you want to win a war rather than lose a battle. There are lots of things you can do to fix it. Remember, relationships are everything in work and support. Assertiveness and good communication make those things successful. Don't forget soft skills. There's lots of technical stuff here, but soft skills are important. Relationships take a long time to build, as does reputation. They can be destroyed very quickly. Here's the acknowledgement to somebody who teaches some of this stuff in Oxford University and a book that she recommends if you want to read a bit more about it. A couple of those overtook me, but I think we more or less got there with a lot to say. me next and I'm just going to take two seconds to say something before we start which is you might wonder why my presentation is slightly different in a different format to everybody else's um, when Sue Fells um, persuaded me I think that is the right word uh, to do this she said I could I didn't particularly want to to start with um, and she said I could do it on any topic I liked so I decided to do it on the one topic I know better than anything else and that I probably know better than anybody else as well which is me so I'm going to tell you the story of my life in 20 slides and what I've learned along the way. So I will now set it going. So I was born in a sleepy little Nottinghamshire town called Retford. I had quite an, un, you know, un, un, uh, uh, that's no good on the petrol culture, is it? It's okay. Um, not a very, um, st well, it was a very standard upbringing. My dad was a car mechanic. My mum was a secretary. Uh, but the most exciting thing that happened to me was that my uncle and auntie had a farm. And I used to visit this farm all the time. I used to feed little lambs that I soon learned to grow up to be grumpy, stupid sheep. My first pet was a cow. I loved cows. I had a pet cow called Christine. I used to ride my cow um, every night, milking. And I learned to hate hens. Can't see the point of them. Don't like them at all. Um, I went to school, Retford County High School for Girls, which had a canal running next to it. On the other side of the canal was the boys' school, which was really interesting in winter when the canal froze over and you could walk over it. Um, that was the bike I used to ride to school on for a very short period of time because I uh, rode at speed into a concrete post in it, bent the frame completely in half, went over the handlebars, smashed my face, broke my nose, and ended up in an ambulance. Um, I was a bit of a rebel at school. Um, that's me doing my DFE award. I refused to be a prefect. I wouldn't take the subjects they wanted me to at O-level or A-level. What you can't see, it's me at the top in the beanie hat, is in that hat, is the skin of a stoat that I have skinned and, and tanned myself because I really learnt a love of biology at school. I had a bio biology teacher who encouraged us to bring in roadkill. Um, <laughs> I know. If it was small, like a mole, we would skin it, boil it, and then wire the bones together so all the students could study it. One day, me and my friend found a badger, so we put it in a carrier bag and took it to school. It was too big to boil, so we buried it in the playing fields in the hope that a year later we could dig it up and it would have rotted, and I can tell you uh, that it hadn't when we dug it up. Um, <laughs> We then, I decided to go to university, I decided to do anatomy. No idea why, I think it was something to do with the roadkill. Uh, when I was interviewed, the professor interviewing me tried to put me off. He asked me if I'd got cats, that's my current cat, George. I said yes. Um, he said, well, we do experiments on cats, do you still want to come? And then he took me around the dissecting room to see if I passed out. And I'm pleased to say I didn't pass out. However, I did decide that anatomy probably wasn't my subject. And um, very quickly changed to genetics. I loved, loved genetics. And I also discovered I hated botany. Don't know why, nothing, nothing like plants at all. I committed the cardinal sin as a student, as you can see, by wearing double denim. So I had a denim skirt and a denim shirt there. And for some reason, I am carrying a bottle of wine. Uh, which I don't know why, because actually that's, my, uh, that's where I worked. Um, I did a PhD then in genetics. That's just to prove I was once a real scientist and I was allowed to touch machines. And nowadays, I don't even understand the words in that paper I wrote, never mind the paragraphs. After that, I did a postdoc, and then I thought, right, better get, better get a proper job. I had no idea what people did in central admin at all, um, but I thought I'd apply for a job there. And I got one. And I got one, and I got a job as a committee secretary. And for two years, I looked after 33 committees. All I did was write reports, agendas, and minutes. And that's actually a picture of one of the committees I looked after in 1985. I was very organized. But we did it with no technology, okay? There was no backspace uh, key. There was tip -outs. 
um, cut and paste meant scissors and magic tape. Not sellotape, because that left a black line, magic tape. Post-it notes were invented when I was there, and they were brought into my office, and my colleagues said, post-it notes, they'll never catch on. What's wrong with a paperclip? Um, and we had one of the only two fax machines in the university, and we used to spend an awful lot of time faxing um, pictures to each other because we thought that was magic. I became a clog dancer, help, 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 my Monica on Twitter, uh, clogging Chris, um, Northwest clog, step clog, and at the bottom I have danced on either side of the equator with a friend of mine. My, I'm in the northern hemisphere, Jane's in the southern hemisphere dancing there. So we got to dance in some pretty cool places. I then went to work in the medical school and I learned several things in the medical school. Not only had post-it notes not caught on, neither had paper clips, and they stuck everything together with pins, which meant when I put my hand in the filing cabinet, it used to come out dripping with blood. I also learned that the only PC in the medical school was behind a locked door, and that part of my role was to take the condoms off the Christmas tree every year, which the medical students used to decorate with them. I had a fantastic time in the medical school. It taught me a lot, and I actually got to watch things like operations. I watched open heart surgery and things. And I also compiled a hit list of students that I have seen graduating to doctors that if I ever come around in an accident and emergency unit and they're over, looking over me, I will ask to be transferred somewhere else. <laughs> um, at 1996, the university formed a new department called Corporate Information and I was asked to head it up and it pulled together all of the admin computing, Mac services, um, the web, uh, management information. Not long after that, the Director of Academic Computing Services retired and I was asked to pull together academic and admin computing services. Departments with very different cultures. I have to say, it wasn't an easy task. Um, the academic computing people obviously have been running the network and all the research computing. And for a long time, I must admit, I did feel like the Wicked Witch. A, I was a woman, didn't go down too well, and B, I knew nothing about IT. Um, that probably wasn't uh, good either. So I did, I did have, a, there was a lot of change went on, and I did feel, so a bit like the Wicked Witch. Just after that, I got married. Now, I've not mentioned my first marriage and divorce, just glossed over that. All you need to know is my first husband, when I met him, had three boys. We then had two boys. I then met, who I like to refer to as my current husband, uh, who has four boys, so there are six together. So I have nine boys in total, two more, I've got a football team, and I'm thinking of entering into next year's World Cup. <laughs> Um, USIZE has played a really big part in my life. I've been Vice Chair and Chair of the Executive and I'm currently Chair of the Organising Committee for the Annual Conference. I've met some wonderful people. I've had a cuddle from John Lloyd of um, QI and Blackadder fame. Um, Ruby Wax called me a geek girl and I had a lovely conversation with uh, Barry Cryer who had his hand on my leg but told me that was okay because he was over 80. <laughs> um, so my department now is very different. It's kicked very different how it used to be. We make a lot of use of social media, of creative media. We look after really modern things for students. The one thing that hasn't changed is the use of post-it notes. I think we use more post-it notes now than we ever have done. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to finish by telling you five things about me, five quirky things about me you might not know. I don't like chickens, but I like falcons. And I'm really into falconry, and that's me taking Harry's hook for a walk. I'm in the process of covering my back with a massive tattoo, where the flowers all represent my children and grandchildren. Um, I decorate, build, and dress dolls' houses as a hobby. And uh, I love fireworks. And the bottom picture is me about to go in a corifoc, which is a Spanish fire festival where you actually run underneath the fireworks. And I've also developed a very relaxed attitude to parenting. Um, <laughs> now I've got grandchildren. Um, so, five learning things. Be friendly and friendly. Don't just make friends with the cuddly lambs. Cows can be your friends, okay? You need to be friends with everybody. Um, things change. They're going to carry on changing, whether it's post-it notes, paper clips, whatever. Just get over it. Um, if you are pursuing a course of action, which you know is right, either for you or the institution, and you're thought of as the Wicked Witch, I hope you get the reference to Defy Gravity, right above it. You've got to keep going down your path. Um, grow old disgracefully. Fully intend to keep doing that for as long as I can. And life is a product of your choices. When I was that 19-year-old geneticist, I didn't know where I was going to end up. I didn't know I was going to end up here. But I like to think that I finished up here because it's a product of choices I made, not of things that just happened to me. And finally, uh, this is one of my well, wonderful quotes. It's by Douglas Bader. Rules are meant for the guidance of wise men and the obedience of fools. It's another way of saying that rules are meant to be broken. And those of the more observant of you may have noticed that I've broken three Petrocutra rules during this um, talk, and I'll leave it to you to work out what they are. Thank you.
So that brings us to the end of today's sessions. I really hope you've enjoyed your first day. Um, don't forget that we this evening we have drinks and barbecue um, from 8pm onwards, but we also have the showcase at 7 o'clock, the hardware showcase um, from one of our suppliers, Lavino. And also just to say that we've got the fabulous um, family fortunes to look forward to this evening as well hosted by our very glamour, glamorous Kath over there. So um, we do hope you will join us um, and we'll see you on later on this evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>